Hey, welcome, welcome all. Uh, welcome back to another edition of twitch.tv slash mdlayer, working on some Go projects. Uh, Dominic, thank you so much for the six months. I appreciate it. Uh, it's very kind of you, certainly. Uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, how you doing, JV Pratt? Good to see you. Metal Matza, good to see you as well. Uh, what's going on, Mighty Core? Yeah, so today we are getting into a project I've been hacking on for a couple of days now. Um, I, I had an idea, so... I've been working on some stuff with ZFS now for a while and kind of over the past few months, I've really kind of like tightened up my setup. I've got things like, you know, automatic replication and backups using a tool called ZREPL, which is super cool. Um, automatic scrubbing. Now I have a couple of SSDs in my pool as well for, so I can do trim and everything too. Um, I'm using those as a ZFS special device, which is pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, so kind of what I wanted to show off is I've been working on this project that hooks into the system called Zed. So uh, Zed is the ZFS events daemon. It is something that's included with the ZFS on Linux project. Basically, it is a, a daemon that monitors the status of the ZFS device. And every time an event is logged, uh, Zed will effectively invoke some kind of shell script or whatever else. But we don't really do shell scripts here. We do Go, right? So... I am writing a ZFS event receiver in Go here, and effectively, um, this little command right here, you know, this this is this, this is it. Uh, this is gonna be a tool that gathers whatever Z sends it, so all these different environment variables, things about the health of the pool, possibly executing some commands, and ultimately sends this to a central server. So, um, kind of how we're gonna go with this is I'll show kind of what I've done so far, how this works, and just kind of demonstrate, you know, where we are at with this effectively. So it uh, should be a really good time. Let me just, uh, let's see here, close a couple of windows. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, happy Friday, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Thank you, Planet Scale, for our monthly day off. I certainly appreciate it because I can uh, get a chance to hang out with all of you. So I've got plans later today, so we are starting quite early, which is fun, you know. Z is dead, baby. Uh, I'm not sure I get the reference, I guess, but you're shocked at how quickly I bought those SSDs. Yeah, you talked me into it. I guess I was always curious about the possibility of having like an L2 arc, but in this case in particular, uh, let's see here. So ZFS special device, actually level one text, shout out to Wendell, does good work. Uh, basically, this is a really interesting thread. So for years now, I've been running four drive arrays with ZFS. I started out with four, four terabyte WD reds, then four eight terabyte WD reds, and now my pool is four 18 terabyte Seagate Exos, which are sweet. Um, and those are really, really fast. I'm running mirror pairs, like they can scrub at like 500 megabytes per second, which is insane. Uh, but basically they are still hard drives. They still have like, you know, spinning rust, right? So the ZFS special device is really interesting. Uh, the allocations in the special class are dedicated to specific block types. By default, this includes all metadata, so things like your file metadata and such, the indirect blocks of user data, and any dedupe tables. But the class can also be provisioned to accept small file blocks. So what I'm doing basically is I have a couple of one terabyte SSDs in a mirror. Uh, they were relatively inexpensive, Samsung 870s. I had a couple of slots on my SAS controller still. So I have my four hard drives and two SSDs, and effectively... All of the metadata from my pool is now stored on SSD and as well as the small files. So for example, I have like an entire file system for Git repositories and such. Um, I can log in there and you know, basically clone all of my Git repos from GitHub, make sure I have backups of everything at the latest version. And I've got it set up so that everything in that uh, ZFS file system, basically, I believe every file in there should end up on SSD because the files are so small. And as long as the record size is less than 128K, it will go on to SSD, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is a really interesting thread. Basically, you can figure out whether or not this would be useful for you. You can run a command like ZDB right here. This will show you a lot of statistics about your pool, as well as like, you know, what sort of data classes you have allocated, what the sizes are. And Wendell also posted this command so that you can show a histogram of the file sizes in your pool as well. So in my particular case, I either have, you know, big media files or fairly small, like kind of like metadata e files or maybe some smaller pictures and such. But uh, yeah, I, I noticed that this seems to be working pretty damn well. Um, I want to show you all the output, but the problem is, is that if I show the output on stream, I think it shows the drive serial numbers. And 
Uh, I understand that like even if people don't have the drive, they can do like an advanced replacement with like Seagate or something, and that could be pretty bad. So maybe maybe I can show it um, in some sort of sensitive way. Let's let's find out, right? I know you can like run a command to like have it dereference the names. So give me just one sec. I gotta remember the syntax for this. Is it dash L? I was looking at it the other day because I was curious for this reason. Um, it's not it. Status dash L primary. Yeah, okay. So this works. So this is the current topology of my ZFS pool. Uh, primary is the name of the Z pool. Mir zero and Mir one are both 18 terabyte WD or WD, uh, Seagate Exos drives. Uh, I've been buying WD for forever. Um, way back in like 2009, I bought a Seagate one and a half terabyte drive, like when those are brand new and it was really fast, but uh, I think I had at least two of them die on me and I don't think I bothered to replace it after the second time. I was like, you know, I'm, I'm good. I don't trust this thing anymore. So I had been buying WD for quite a long time, but uh, Seagate Exos drives are sweet. Uh, you can find them for the same price as like your Seagate Iron Wolves. So frankly, there is no reason to buy a consumer drive when you can get the enterprise version instead with better firmware, better warranty, better error reporting. And then my special device here is a couple of SSDs. So uh, let's see here. Importantly, if you only care about metadata and not small files, you don't really need a lot of SSD space to support a lot of storage. Yes, that's true. I believe the calculation that Wendell said in the forum was like 0.3% or something like that. So um, for, for file metadata, 0.3% of the size of your files is like a good, a good estimate. For what it's worth, I think that my usage on my volumes is something like 60 gigs out of the one terabyte drive. So I definitely went overkill, could have gone for 500 gigs or whatever, but uh, I'm so old school. I bought WD before they were scummy. Yeah. Yeah. I've been buying WD for like a long time. My, my desktop, um, I built my first desktop in 2008 and at the time the best available drive, I think that was not an SSD because SSDs were crazy expensive was a WD black. So I had WD black and then I had a couple of WD greens for a while for storage. And now I'm finally back to Seagate for the first time in a decade. So, or, you know, 13 years, I think. Um, but I've been really happy with them so far. So Dominic actually inspired me to check out Seagate again, in particular, the Exos drives. And I got a pretty good deal. I'm really, really happy with them. They are crazy fast, you know, 7,200 RPM enterprise drives rated for like what, 2.5 million hours mean time between failure. Like it's insane. Five-year warranty. Like in my mind, like you're foolish if you buy consumer drives when you can get an Exos for effectively the same price. So uh, that's that's my stance these days. So 0.3% for metadata is a good estimate and for you is even less. Nice. Yeah, I, I've got tons of space on this pool. Let me, let's try one more command really quick. Um, I'm going to make sure again, I can hide my serial numbers, it probably doesn't matter, but, uh, so I want IO stat with the same flags. Yeah, okay. Primary. Yeah, so if, if you take a look at this, you can see uh, I have 6.39 terabytes out of 27, you know, 6.39 terabytes allocated 27.2 free. You can see the, the two mirror pairs here. So three terabytes allocated on this pair, three terabytes allocated on this pair. And then my special device, uh, about 60 gigs of data, 869 gigs free. So, uh, you know, we've got some we've got some headroom here, which is pretty cool. <laughs> so we're in pretty good shape for a while. Exos regularly costs less than Iron Wolf. I have no idea why. Um, I'm just going to I'm just going to keep buying them because, you know, hopefully Seagate doesn't notice. But Yeah. Uh, can you share one special VDEV with multiple pools? I doubt it because the special VDEV becomes part of the pool as well. So I don't think there's any way to share a special between pools. I guess, Dominic, if you're feeling, if you're feeling, could you not partition the special device or the SSDs into two partitions and then put one partition in one VDEV and one partition in another VDEV and then you have different VDEVs for different pools? Uh, Z pool output should properly nest the special device. Yeah, I agree. It, it does seem weird here that it's at the same level. Like, I feel like this should be nested one more time. Um, I, I was noticing that same thing, actually. Uh, Trellian says, my first drive was actually a Bigfoot. That was before my time, I believe. Uh, let's see. Bigfoot, HDD. 
Quantum Bigfoot. Holy cow. So, yeah, some serious old school stuff back here. Yeah, I, let's see. I think our first one, we bought a gateway computer in 1997 or 98, my family did. And I think it had a 10 gig hard drive. I do not remember the manufacturer at this point. Um, but yeah, showing your age, <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, so I guess I, I kind of want to, I want to dive in here and show what we're working on. So I have a status test. So I have this test pool here. I just basically allocated like a one gig file. I've been running this because I want to generate ZFS events. This seems to work pretty well. And I will show you all effectively what this does. So uh, in order for us to do that, I need a couple terminals. So I need to be able to run the Zhook D receiver. I think that what I have works. So will you sell your tool to LTT? Uh, I mean, it's open source, but yeah, they should use it because they're not monitoring their stuff. But <laughs> um, let's see here. Oh, not go run uh, Zhook D already. All right. So what I have right now is the the server can listen over both it can listen over both TCP and HTTP or TCP and Unix socket. So at the moment, um, we're gonna have to do some work on this today. I was just kind of prototyping this last night. So remove this or do nothing, and then run this guy. So does this need root? No, but removing the file does. Okay. So the receiver is running. Um, I already let's see here. So let's see zfs z dot d. So I have a copy of the all dash Z hook binary. So all prefix here makes it so that it gets every ZFS event. So Z is a thing that is watching the ZFS kernel module for events and it's going to execute everything in this folder. So again, we don't want to write a bash script. There are lots of bash scripts in there packaged with ZFS. Uh, we're going to do a go binary cause that's, you know, a little more, uh, makes me happy. So if I run, for example, a scrub on test, it's not going to take very long. It's a, like a one gig file. Uh, you can see here, we actually generated a bunch of output. So let's see. So when this first starts up, um, there's a couple of debug logs in here, bear with me. So we get a Z event class scrub start. So we can tell a scrub is starting in this pool. It tells me which pool it was, tells me the GUID of the pool, uh, the current state, etc. There's a lot of different stuff going on here. Um, we're filtering some metadata. There's a couple of fields that ZFS returns that are just not useful for us, like you know shell commands and stuff. And what I also have in here is I've got a couple of hooks so that, for example, when we see a scrub finish, uh, we wanna check the state of the pool afterward. It'll actually execute the raw ZFS command. Um, I know that kind of stinks. I don't like it either, but I understand the ZFS, like you know, binding to the actual ZFS kernel module is a non-trivial amount of effort. So the way Z works is that it hands you paths to all the binaries and we just execute. If we find a path to the Z pool binary and a pool name and certain events, we execute status and just ship it up here. The idea with all of this being, we gather as much raw data as possible, keep this script effectively, this Zlet is what they're called, uh, ZFS, let's see here, ZFS event daemon linkage for executable tasks. So Zlet, you can kind of think of like a shell script invoked by Zed. Um, we execute the Zlet, we ship it to Zhook D, which is the Go receiver I'm writing, and then Zhook D will be able to do whatever it wants with all of this. So yeah, let's let's show what this is doing effectively. So I this is pretty quick. I have no idea if it does like signal handling or not, but. I wrote a couple of things in here. So for example, if we get an interrupt, cancel the context. If we time out, cancel the context, like just kind of try and do these things quickly, one off run, um, short running client, not a big deal. So the client type here, uh, basically what this is, is this is a small HTTP client that can connect over both Unix socket and HTTP. So. Uh, Peter Morgan actually authored this library called Unix Transport, which supports this HTTP plus Unix scheme. So I am using that to register in my clients here so I can also talk over HTTP. So when you are configuring one of these Zlets, I guess, there are ways you can do it with like an environment variable, but what I will expect the use case will be is you will run the client and server on the same machine. 
So by default, this will try these couple of addresses. First, we try the Unix socket. That will be better because we can do things like, for example, looking at the peer credentials of who's talking to us and verify they're actually authorized to do so, um, which is just a good thing. And we can also fall back to a local host listener as well. Um, that'll be totally fine. In the event that I choose to export these packages, you could specify doing this like off box or with TLS or whatever else. Uh, I feel like for the time being, I'm gonna leave it all internal and really try to encourage people to run these in the same machine. I am not sure it's a super good idea to just ship random stuff. I don't know, I guess there's probably nothing super sensitive in this data, but I, I feel like it makes more sense to just keep everything local where possible. So my expectation is that the Unix socket path will be used first. So by default, we try the Unix socket and HTTP. And effectively what we do here is first we gather a payload from the environment. I'll show what that looks like shortly. Marshal it to JSON and then send a request to first the Unix socket and second the HTTP. Um, HTTP request, do it, make sure we get a no content. There's no response for this, just ZHookD saying, yep, got it. And that's it. So this is, this is pretty interesting. The payload gathering portion. So kind of what I have in mind here is this top level payload struct contains a little bit of data. We have a version number, in this case, V0. I want the ability to potentially change things later if I decide we make a mistake. We totally control the format of this thing. We control all clients and servers. So uh, I feel like that could be useful. So we're gonna do that for now. This is currently V0. Uh, variables here are raw environment variables. So when Z executes your Zlet, your script, if you will, it passes in a bunch of environment variables about the pool. So effectively we parse those out into key value pairs, filter some of them we don't need. And finally, we have, for example, zpool now. So zpool is optional data gathered by executing the zpool command. In this case, just the raw status output at the moment. So we can choose whether or not we actually care about dealing with this. For the time being, we don't execute this for every command. It would be pretty wasteful, especially because my ZFS pool is generating a lot of events because it's doing regular snapshots. So the way the parsing works is we call this make payload function with the environment variables as well as executing the zpool command. There's a little bit of shimming here to make this more testable. Um, here we go. So iterate over every environment variable, make sure they're in the expected format, which is a key value pair. Uh, we just wanna make sure that we split on, actually, hang on. Don't I want split n instead? Slice of substrings between those operators, at most blank substrings, split after n. I feel like I, is it possible for an environment variable value to contain an equal sign? I guess almost certainly, right? So maybe I do want like split n. Let's see here. Substring separated by separator returns a slice of the substrings at most n substrings. So two, right? So I think we actually want this. We'll update the test cases to verify. We take the key, we take the value. Uh, basically, there's a bunch of junk that Zed sends us that we don't really care about. We don't need the IFS. We don't need the path. We don't need all these binaries. Uh, just like, what's the point of shipping these over to our receiver? Um, we don't need the directory where all the Zedlets live. I don't really see how that's useful. And then these, this time, time string, and alias. This is just duplicated data from other fields that we can parse easier. So we skip all of those. We do look at the zpool command because we need that to execute if we want to gather status about the pool. We keep the name of the pool itself. And also we look at the class of the event. Um, so right now, if we get a resilver or a scrub finishing, uh, string split, strings cut. Ah, interesting. I actually have not used, what's up Jay, first of all. I have not used strings cut yet. I will look at that. Um, yep, so you can see this is actually running right now. It's doing some uh, some stuff on my primary pool. This just went ahead and did some snapshotting, which is cool. Um, let's see. So we sort everything first of all. I'm using the generic slices package in this project because this is brand new. I'm gonna require Go 118 and I'm trying to use generics when possible because I just want to get a feel for how they feel in Go. Uh, I have mixed feelings about certain things we'll, we'll discuss as well. So assuming we got a zpool command and the name of a pool and the status flag was set because we saw a resilver finish or a scrub finish and not for example, one of these Let's see here, this is a snapshot, right? History event, uh, we don't care about this. Like this doesn't give us any value to execute the status of the pool, so we skip it. 
Uh, then we will actually call the status function, which is executing out to zpool and then ultimately adding it to the payload. Um, and we've basically already looked at the entire client. Uh, that's really all it does. It, its job is just to be as simple as possible. This is the part, uh, hang on, we'll get to that. This is the part that like I've done the most work on so far. Basically just like, how do you get these things? How do you connect to a local server? How do you filter them? Um, and that's that. So got a couple of test cases here. So first of all, we verify this works over both HTTP and Unix socket, depending on the server. Um, we create a client, we try to execute one push. And then when we get the results of the push, we verify the expected version number, which is always V0. And yeah, here's, here's another use of generics, right? So slice index func, uh, we are basically looking for the key named home and we're then checking to make sure that assuming you're executing this locally, this is gonna gather data from your local environment, which probably is gonna have a home value. And then it will actually verify that the execution gathered that same home value and you filter it out from the slice and you actually check the value. So this works. I am not sure how I feel about this yet. There is a proposal. There's a proposal for effectively this slices find func, you know, something very similar, but without the indexing. I like that one or first, I think is a tentative name. I actually commented on it the other day. So, you know, I historically have been someone who feels pretty strongly that like for loops are fine and it's not really that big of a deal. In this project, I am trying actively to use the generics code when possible because I want to get a feel for what it looks like. I want to get a feel for how it feels to me in Go. Uh, I hate magic values like negative one. I know this is like a common pattern for indexing. Um, I So I think I really, I would like, you know, maybe like a comma okay like this, but that's okay. We'll see, we'll see, we'll get there. Um, before I forget, I actually do wanna look at Jay's. You think you prefer loops over function literals here? I'm tempted to agree with you, but like I said, I'm doing this kind of as a thought experiment a little bit, I guess, just to see, just to see how I how I feel about it. There is a proposal, so let's see here. Uh, x slices right here. So find function. I think it was called first. So I left a comment actually. You know, I'd intended to open this proposal myself today. Here, I'll share the link to this. So there are two places where slices first to be useful for me right now. Uh, again, I am i don't know exactly how I feel about this. I'm trying to lean into it. So if we want to find the first element of a slice where a single struct field matches, this is exactly that case, right? So you have the variables, you call the index func. If the key matches home, we return the value. So a hypothetical version could be slices first, uh, key equals home, value okay. I kind of like that. I feel like that's pretty tidy and expedient and small. And then the other one is in CoreRad, actually, I have this function called pick first, which is a for loop. And given an input type and a slice of interfaces, it will actually do type assertions repeatedly and give you the first one that matches. So that's what we're going for here. Alternatively, if there were a slices first function, I think this could be simplified to this, right? So slices first, do a type assertion. If the type assertion is successful, we return that one. Um, this is kind of nice, I feel like. I, I, I kind of I kind of like the way this fits together, especially if we're returning tbool, and this also returns tbool. Um, I feel like it's pretty tidy, but I, I left a comment here to the effect of what I've been saying. Overall, I'm still unsure where to draw the line between writing a manual for loop or trying to experiment with new generic code, but I figured it was worth sharing my experiences if nothing else. So. Again, I, I'm trying to learn a little bit here, you know? Cool, cool. Oh man, so I forgot I have, uh, <laughs> I have notifications on my phone. So if I, oh, thanks GitHub bot. So whenever I get a, whenever I get a, let's see here. Right now there is a Zedlitz running that will send a message to push bullet actually. So every time my Z pools scrub, I get a push notification. So if I keep running scrub tests today, I'm gonna keep getting push notifications to my phone, which is funny. So eventually the goal would be to replace push bullet probably with this system, probably using Prometheus, but uh, we'll see, we'll get there. Rob Pike says write for loops, so I write for loops. 
Uh, Rob Pike is not always right. I I respect Rob. Uh, you know, we're we're on stream. I'm being recorded. Um, I respect Rob. He's not always right, and I find that Rob tends to be perhaps unnecessarily dogmatic at times, and uh, there's often more nuance in these sorts of conversations than. Yeah, you, know, you, you can't apply dogma to everything, right? Is all, I guess, all I'm trying to say. So while I generally agree with Rob's philosophies, you know, I, the big one, the big one, for example, that comes up all the time is the, the bite order fallacy blog. It's like, you don't need native NDNS. Nobody should use that. And it's like, but I do, like, I'm talking to the system. I'm doing system calls. Like I actually need this. And every time I mention that, you know, this stupid article gets linked and it drives me nuts. Um, so the thing is, is that like, I, I respect his opinions. Ultimately, I know he has you know a lifetime of programming experience and everything, but I am going to try to lean into this new paradigm and try and see how I feel and make my own decisions, I guess, you know. Uh, the real shock will be when the compiler does not inline the anonymous function and each loop iteration has to do a full call. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so I guess in, in theory, like, I don't, this thing is not going to be super high performance. This is going to be however many events, however many minutes, like this is not a big deal, but certainly you're right in performance critical situations. Like what I would do first is write the code the simplest way possible and then profile and benchmark and then use that data to make decisions. Right. Um, I think that's really the, the best way to do this. And in particular with generics. So there've been a couple of discussions recently. Let's see here. So First of all, old.reddit.com. So the Go Reddit, uh, oh goodness, so small. Sorry, it's light mode right now, but so I shared, let's see here. I shared this blog from my company. Um, where is it? Generics can make your Go code slower. So I like this blog. First of all, I like this. I have stated multiple times in the comments here that I do not agree with everything this blog has to say. So that's, I'll, I'll leave it at that. You're welcome to read it. You're welcome to read it if you like. But the the point I wanted to share here, uh, for the most part, I think the, this is this is my comment. You know, I was quoting the person above. For the most part, I think the generics implementation is good enough. And where it isn't usually manually inline things anyway, since the compiler does not have a complex heuristic to begin with. So I say, this is personally how I feel. I believe it was important for the initial 118 release to get the semantics of type parameters correct. To my knowledge, Go has never had an explicit goal of achieving zero cost abstractions. So my friend Antoine, he put a quote that I think does it best. Uh, Use generics if it makes your dev experience better. Profile if it's slow, optimize the slow bits. And that is exactly the line I am sticking to. I will use them whenever it makes sense. I will not think about the performance. I will not think about, you know, virtual call overhead or anything else. I will use them if it makes my experience better. And then Antoine reminded me, so do you remember how defers used to be kind of slow? So defer statements, a huge improvement in the development experience over manual cleanup at every return call. And over time, defers were reworked to be effectively zero cost. So there was no longer any justification to avoid using them. So I suspect generics will probably end up the same way. Ultimately, you know, things will get faster. We may monomorphize. We may be able to eliminate some of these calls. Um, so this, that's, that's how I feel, basically. I think that sums up best. You know, you're welcome to read the thread for yourself if you'd like. But that is the approach I am taking, and I am going to do what makes my development experience better. So if slices first is that, then I'll use it. Uh, the simplest way possible is based entirely on an individual's experience. There was a time where you found the loops the simplest way, and there was a time where you found the functional way the simplest. Yeah, certainly. I, I'm not saying one of those is strictly better than the other. What I am saying is that if you are trying to optimize, um, I... I worked with someone once who was trying to optimize pointer dereferences in a MySQL client, and there's no point, right? Like you are literally talking to MySQL, MySQL's doing IO, like why the hell are you trying to get pointer dereferences out of the driver? Like it just frankly seems foolish. Like it does not seem necessary. So VMG's post, yeah, yeah. I, I certainly, I, I respect VMG a ton. He's clearly a very talented engineer. Uh, you know, I'm not at all trying to diss him or his opinions. I'm not, I'm just saying I don't agree with all of them. That's all. Uh, that is always how you should approach using any feature in anything, isn't it? Uh, yes, doing the simplest thing first, yes. Uh, you like that new Go proverb? Yeah, I totally agree. Ge yeah, use generics when it makes sense. I mean, that's, that's what I tell everybody all the time. Like if you were 
benchmarking things like, you know, I another case I saw was uh, benchmarking switch lookups versus like map lookups. And it's just uh, do the simplest thing is my is my thought. LMAO what? I assume in response to the pointer dereference thing. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I just, uh, I'm just going to sit here and build software that works and do the simplest thing and then make it clever later on. <laughs> so. And then profile it to make it fast in conjunction with that. Yes, exactly. So I think we're all on the same page. It seems like many, it seems like we're all on the same page about this sort of thing. So uh, that was quite a tangent about generics and performance and, you know, um, everything else. But anyway, uh, Dominic has an eternal internal, eternal internal. That's a hard one to say. Eternal internal struggle between don't optimize prematurely and don't waste CPU cycle stupidly. Well, Dominic, uh, there was the one issue on static check where someone said that, you know, you could be saving the earth by making static check consume less electricity, right? <laughs> There's a there's a great issue somewhere. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pull it up, but it was really funny. So here's where I'm at with the server so far. Um, this is all experiments. Dominic says true. <laughs> Basically, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna take what I've been hacking on over here and kind of move it into a package and ultimately get this more in place. We've already been going for 40 minutes, and I feel like we haven't written a line of code, which is funny. So whatever. We have a push handler. It only accepts posts. It only accepts JSON. Uh, we decode the Z hook payload. And then depending on whether we are HTTP or Unix socket, we do things a little differently. I'll explain. And right now we just print the payload to the screen. We see all these key values and that's that. So what I'm doing here is I am opening a TCP listener and then opening a Unix socket listener. And then I'm combining them using my multi-net utility. So I wrote this package a while back. Um, I forget. I feel like, Jay, I feel like I wrote this. Someone in Ann Arbor had a question about like combining net listeners. And I was like, oh, that could be fun. And I wrote this little thing. So given a list of net listeners, it will accept on all of them, return net cons, which are opaque. They could be different types. And you don't really have to care. Like this basically abstracts over a group of net listeners and gives you a single connection back. But I'm using this right now to abstract over TCP and Unix and just pass a single listener to the server instead of, oops, sorry. Uh, this is just kind of fun. I don't know. Like, I, I feel like I can probably just as easily call, you know, create another HTTP server, use the same handler. It's probably fine. Um, this just seems kind of fun, I guess. I'm not actually sure if this is a good idea, but it does work. Uh, we talked about it at a Go meetup, didn't we? I don't remember why. Yeah, I'm not sure either, but I think somebody from Ann Arbor had this problem where they wanted to have a bunch of net listeners, and I was like, oh, I can write that, and I ended up just hacking it up. So I have my NetX package. So does this work? Um, I have this package called NetX where, ah, come on. Basically... This is all just random stuff that I thought was kind of useful. So like EUI64 for IPv6, IPv6 ULAs, this multi-net thing, um, just providing like extracted listeners. So this is like IO multi-writer, but for net con. Um, you can kind of think of it like a multi-acceptor, really. Like it abstracts away everything underneath the interface and makes it so that if you have multiple different, excuse me, if you have multiple different net listeners, it just transparently accepts connections from all of them. So... Uh, yeah, I guess kind of like that, but it's more so like it's multiplexing things together. Uh, Mr. Dillinger, welcome to the stream. Thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. So this works. Um, I want to do some cleanup here, but now let's talk about this. <laughs> I was playing around last night. I was curious what it would take to get a hold of the peer credentials. So when you have a Unix socket connection on the same machine... Uh, oh, you had it backwards. Thank you. It seems like crazy magic. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's a thing. I, I don't actually know if it's a good idea, but again, this project is just for having fun and messing around, so why not? Um, <laughs> are there Go meetups in Michigan? Uh, yeah, so there was uh, there was the Ann Arbor Gophers for a while. I don't know if the meetup has been on hiatus again because due to COVID. I did attend a couple of them before COVID as well. 
Um, I'm not sure if those have gotten started back up or not yet. I used to go over to Ann Arbor sometimes for meetups, but it's been a while due to COVID. So serve Unix, effectively what this does is given your typical HTTP handler, uh, it tries to hijack the underlying TCP connection because we actually need to get a hold of the netcon directly. From there, we can call the peer cred function from inetaf. And basically this is, uh, I forgot this level of abstraction. This gives us this structure, which contains, uh, come on, show me the creds. The PID of who called it and then the user ID of who called it as well. So for example, if we wanna make sure that only root can invoke the Zedlet and send us things, we can actually verify it in this way, like only root. And I guess the PID would be, the PID would be the PID of Zedhook, the Zedhook uh, Zedlet. So um, yeah, this is just something we can do. It's kind of interesting. So you can actually see this is being used here. So it is telling us that this process ID and root are invoking this script because this is going through the Unix socket path. And then we are just faking writing back at 204 um, because we now have a raw TCP connection. Although I remembered last night, so this exists, right? So HTTP response, uh, let's see here. Status, status code, proto. So we have to specify how much that do we have to specify? I actually have no idea, but there there is a response right to W. We can do this. Is that just a single return value? It is. So this consults the following, status code, major, minor, method. Okay, so we want the status code, major, minor, and the header. So what we can do, is status code, status, no content. Major is the same as the request. Uh, Jay said it's not started since COVID. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, if you do hear about those, Jay, please do send me a message because I would love to come hang out again. Um, I had a really good time at the, the previous one. So major, minor, and then we write it to the screen. So write it to the screen, write it to the response writer. So this is this is better. Last night I was just like, well, HTTP is not that hard. I can just do this. So I, I figured I would just try that, but this, this is better. This is strictly better. And in fact, we're gonna, I think we're gonna inline this because I just wanna keep it tidy. Okay. Um, and then headers, right? I talked about headers as well. So header, uh, content type. Oh no, there is no content type. Which just we just have the server. So server Z hook D. It doesn't really matter. It's like the, the client isn't actually consulting any of this. I just thought it might be interesting. So let, let's give this a try. Uh, you'll let you know, heck, I'll ping the guys right now about getting it going again. Yeah, please do, Jay. Uh, that would be great. I, I would love to. Is, is there a, do we have a channel on Gopher Slack? A2 Go? Yeah, we do. Jay and I are both interested in getting the meetup going again. What do you folks think? Cool, good deal. Uh, you would go, you're in Grand Haven, so Ann Arbor is doable, not as good as East Lansing though. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I'm in Kalamazoo, so it's definitely farther away for me as well. Uh, but a Grand Haven to Ann Arbor would be quite a drive for sure. I don't know, I'm actually not sure what the Lansing tech scene is like. So in Michigan, Grand, or Grand Rapids, um, well, I guess maybe them, but in Michigan, I think Ann Arbor is probably the biggest tech spot. There is some in Detroit and then Ann Arbor is the biggest tech spot. There's some in Detroit as well. And then probably some in Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo. There's a little, just a little, I thought you were in Jackson now. No, I am from Jackson, but I have no intent of living in Jackson. I can tell you that, <laughs> uh, Kalamazoo. I'm still in Kalamazoo. I bought a house here, uh, last year. So um, we're going to need more terminals because actually deploying this thing is kind of a pain in the neck. So Z hook D, 
So because my server is running NixOS, we have to disable CGO. You're learning so much about Michigan being German right now. Nice. Uh, I need to SCP this to my server temp directory. We're going to do effectively the same down here. So Ann Arbor's nice to say that, but Jackson's so great. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, JBid. Uh, <laughs> JBid is also from Jackson. So pretty, pretty funny. My, my friend calls it the dirty J, which I think is hilarious, but uh, what am I doing? Seago, there we go. Okay, so we have the Zedlet as well as the, oh, shoot. So we got both those. We need to copy, well actually, so we, we can copy it and we can run scrubs, but if we just wanna like demonstrate that the thing actually works, um, one sec, one sec. I need to verify that like if I do this with like my local user, it doesn't dump any like secrets in the environment. Um, let's see here. Let's find out. Uh, that did not work because the demon's not running. I'm done. Okay. Hang on one sec. My apologies. I need to make sure I don't compromise anything secret on stream. Uh, all Z hook. Uh, does this need creds? I think it might actually. So, oh, let's see. GTK home info. Mail. There's just a bunch of random stuff like QT WebKit. Why in the world is QT WebKit on my server Mozilla? Seems strange. I think we're fine. I think we're fine. So getting back to this. Uh, yeah, so this, this appears to work actually. So that's good. Yep, uh, so push to push to zhook.soc, 204, no content server. Yep, cool. So that's definitely better than what I had before. So I, I will take that. Let's see. Uh, Lansing has a pretty great tech scene. They have TechSmith as well as all the state employees. Definitely more legacy enterprise focused. Your friend owns a software company there. Yeah, you know, I, I know like Auto Owners is up there too. And it's kind of funny because I kind of assumed when I was in school that I would end up like, you know, at Auto Owners or the state of Michigan or something or something. And uh, then I discovered what startups were and it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'm definitely happier. Uh, the reference to East Lansing was more of an MSU is better than U of M. Ah, I gotcha. I think Grand Rapids is growing for a tech scene too. Yes, it is. Actually, I think at one point there was like a Grand Rapids go meetup too, but I think they may, may have only met once. So I would love to do Kalamazoo. We do have like a Kalamazoo software meetup, but that has also been on hiatus a little bit. You have a friend at Auto Owners? Yeah, me too. Uh, I, nah, I'm good. I'm good. That's all That's all I gotta say. I'm, I'm, I'm happy where I'm at. So, <laughs> uh, okay, we gotta fix that. Let's fix the Unix socket garbage. So, we need to do signal handling and then ultimately remove the thing on shutdown, I think is probably the correct call. Um, copy to, first of all, let's put the new copy of it in here. CFS, ZD, all Z hook. Yep. Does this work? Yes, it does. Okay. So uh, I think we want to add signal handling to this. I want to clean this up just a little bit. So we're going to have to, I'll just had a little hair fly away. Copy this and then we have to add some shutdown logic. Um, you know, we should probably put this in a package actually it would be smart, but really quick. Take a context, cancel, cancel. Um, so we need the ability to stop, stop this server, right? We need the ability to stop the server, so. Mm -hmm. 
or we could use an abstract socket. Uh, Dominic, what is an abstract socket? Is that, is, is that like a socket that lives on like an undefined path or something? So I guess the thing is, is like I do want a well-known location for this because of the fact that I'm hard coding the paths right here because Z is going to invoke this, passing arguments into this is a pain in the neck. So I am going to keep it as simple as possible and just try these two paths. So abstract socket. Is the, I know I've heard that before, but I it's escaping me. I have not really worked with Unix sockets very much, but um, I think we could just, I, I want to add cleanup logic anyway. So I'm just going to do that. We have the listener. Uh, we are going to create an air group. Linux has an abstract namespace for Unix sockets. So the socket has a name, but not in the file system. Interesting. So Linux abstract socket. Abstract sockets. Uh, let's see here. Sockets permissions have no meaning. Automatically disappear when all open references to the socket are closed. Interesting. How do you create an abstract socket? Abstract. Types of address are distinguished in the, let's see here. The name has no connection. When the addresses of an abstract socket is returned. Hmm. I, but I, I do want like a, a specified place in the file system unless this just would not do that, right? So path name. Sounds like Windows pipes. Yeah, I think so too. Should this be portable back to other systems that support ZFS? Uh, Hipster Doofus, yeah, that's a good question actually. Nice username. Uh, I actually, I, I wasn't sure if Zed, I guess that, that that's that's a good point. So I was kind of assuming Linux for all of this, but does Zed work? Hang on, uh, open ZFS Zed. Does Zed work on other Unixes? ZFS on Linux specifically. Troubleshooting. I don't know if Zed works on other Linuxes or not, or other Unixes or not. Uh, let's see here. So an abstract socket would be named something like well-known socket name and clients can connect to that name. You do lose file permissions. You have to handle permissions yourself. Interesting. Well, that should be, should be okay, but Perhaps in the interest of in the interest of keeping this possibly cross-platform, maybe I should not. But that's an interesting idea. I wonder if this runs on ZFS Z. Let's say FreeBSD. Sure. It's called ZFSD DevD ZFSD ZFS Fault Management Daemon. Okay. Uh, so maybe this maybe Z is exclusively Linux then. Well, for, for the time being, uh, this will work. And then we want to clean up anyway, because we're going to want to eventually probably like sync a file to, we're going to want to probably like have like a record of things. Like we're going to keep a journal of some sort, I think. As far as picking unique names goes, one trick many programs seem to use is to use whatever file name uh, they would be using if they didn't have the abstract socket variable namespace. This gives you a convenient way of expressing per user sockets. You can give it a name based on the user's home directory. Other programs use a hierarchical namespace. Ubuntu's upstart listens on the abstract socket name com Ubuntu upstart. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, yeah, for the time being, we'll, we'll we'll keep it simple. We'll do we'll do this, but we're gonna we're gonna want to clean things up anyway. That goes away. Um, let's see here. So CTX done. Then we cancel. So serve. Um, hello. This is not building for some reason. 
You get it, you can teach something to the Linux socket guru. <laughs> I would not call myself a socket guru by any means, but I, I've definitely learned a lot, you know. Uh, Zen hook D. Oh, thanks, tidy. Oh, so it did compile, it just need to be tidy. Well, that's annoying, okay. So serve, shut down, gracefully shut down. Um, wait indefinitely for all. So I guess maybe at this point we derive a context, but it would already be canceled because the parent would be canceled. So maybe at this point, actually, no, I guess it doesn't matter, right? So we do, context, uh, let's see here, with timeout. Attached from parent, uh, parent is already, the parent is already canceled, but we want to give a short period of time for outstanding requests to complete and drain. Let's say this, for example, Just cancel. Fatal F failed to shut down HTTP server. HTTP server shut down. Okay, uh, this seems pretty seems pretty good to me. So unlink on close. So once the server shuts down, we explicitly want to close the listener, I think. And that should effectively force failed to close HTTP listener. So I think some combination of these things should result in the, fi the file disappearing from the file system as well. So. Oh, right, so I need to actually make a directory here. Is unlink and close some automatic kernel magic? I am not sure, let's find out though. Uh, permission denied. Uh, whatever. Keep it simple, right? This is gonna be deployed with the systemd unit in other machines, so. Well, that seems to work. Cool. So it appears to be cleaning itself up now um, as I close this listener especially. So uh, let's dig in, Dominic. Um, so unlink. Unlink once, syscall unlink. We have to clean it up ourselves, interesting. So it's not kernel magic, it's go magic, it would appear. That's cool though. I mean, it's one of the reasons, it's go net package, yeah. It's one of the reasons I was using the uh, netlist in Unix anyway, it's because I wanted the ability to set that. So uh, that should tidy things up appropriately. And then let's see here. Let's add a couple of logs really quick. We'll show the string for both of these. So TCP listener, the address, as well as the Unix listener address. And then we will terminate. So, So 
see if signal shutting down. We don't actually care what the signal is necessarily. We're gonna keep things simple for now by using the notify context. Where do you handle control C? Right here. Yeah, so <laughs> we're on the same page, Dominic. Uh, yeah, signal notify context. I think the one thing I don't like about this API is that you can't actually figure out what the signal is. So you have to track that yourself if you want to, or you have to use a different API, um, which I think is a little unfortunate, but actually there is a proposal out right now. So you can do like, I, I believe Samir proposed like with, uh, let's see here. So with cause uh, OS interrupts, something like that. So when we cancel a context, you'll be able to append this and then you'll be able to look at this using the error utilities, which would be nice. But um, again, still a proposal. So uh, I did not rebuild. Unix, HTTP. Yep. Cool. So that's that. That seems to work well. Um, let's uh, should probably commit this, or I guess we should probably just clean this up now. Now that we've got this working. So I'm going to checkpoint by staging everything really quick. There is so much context magic these days. You remember when you were young, handling signals the old-fashioned way? Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, notify context is pretty nice. Um, I mean, it saves you from writing this yourself, which is cool. Um, what's this? If the error is nil... You start a go routine, cancel or done. Interesting. If the error in the context is nil, you stop it. I see, okay. So if you pass in a context that already has an error, this doesn't happen. Interesting, okay, so that's that's how that works. Cool. Uh, yeah, that'll do it. So I guess I should probably bind to localhost just to make this more locked down as we had intended. So good deal. So yeah, we're going to checkpoint this really quick. I'm not actually going to push this to GitHub yet because this is a little nasty still, but I want to at least checkpoint everything we've done so far and then tidy everything up. So we are pulling in NetX, sync, peer cred. Yep, yep, yep. Um, a bunch of dependencies. Why do I have, oh, right. I was adding logging here because I was confused as to which server we were talking to. So let's see here. I suppose if I wanted to, I could make it so this actually returns like which server it talk to or like what it sent, but kind of want to keep it simple. Authentic Matt Lairstream. What's going on? <laughs> Truly authentic. Rare to find. <laughs> yeah, perhaps so these days. Yeah, it's been a little bit, hasn't it? Um, probably about a month. I, yeah, I've got plans later today. So we're starting early today and then uh, we are going to... I don't know. I'm not sure when the next time I'll stream will be. Uh, generally, yeah, these these first weekend of the month things work pretty well because of the um, planet scale day off, which is great. But I did want to check the payload test really quick to verify that if we send something with another equal sign, it actually works. So one sec. This is under internal now. Okay. No status, status, let's see here. We want something with an equal sign because we want to make things, we wanna test this out appropriately. So ignored. Um, extra equals sign. So Jay, you forever ago said I should use strings cut, right? I actually totally forgot. Like I was like, oh yeah, we should get back to that. And then we totally forgot. I have not used that yet. So what does that do? Um, let's see here, right here. So the first instance to separator, returning the text before and after. Oh, yo, that's sweet. Okay. Uh, environment, the separator is equals. And then before, after. Yeah. 
Is that what that does? Am I understanding this correctly? Uh, yep, that works. So the key, the value, if the separator does not appear, it returns false. Uh, strings cut replaces a whole bunch of indexing and splitting patterns. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I like that a lot, actually. That is that is great. Um, thank you, Jay, for the tip. I appreciate that if you're still here. Uh, let's see here. So... The event test equals uh, foo equals bar. That works. Cool. Yeah, that's good to know because that would have bitten me later if something had happened to return an equal sign. So that's a that's a good trick. I'm curious how that is. Well, it's probably like a byte alg, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's just index. Okay. The first index, before, after, true. Huh. That's great. That's a super useful function. Is that also a 118? Nope. I actually did want the package that got dev. Uh, cut is go 118. Yeah, cool. Nice. I love uh, when you discover a standard library function you didn't know you needed. It's a great feeling. So let's checkpoint everything we've done so far, and then let's go clean up the server. So I basically want to take all of this and split it out into its own package. Um, it's been a while since I've made an HTTP server. I, I tend to do stuff at a lower level. Uh, it's a great new addition, but it bit me a bit though when copying the cookie pieces recently. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, it sounds about right. Sometimes, sometimes stuff will uh, get a little confusing. Uh, static check will probably suggest using strings cut instead of a number of manual patterns. Nice, that'd be sweet. What's your example here? It's a bad idea to copy parts of the Go standard library the day after a new release. You were using Go 118 locally copying code with strings cut and the builds fail with 117. Yep, sadly the errors while building weren't super useful. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm glad that, you know, this is a project where I'm requiring 118, so I can just say, sorry, you gotta use 118 to build this. <laughs> so I guess we really, we don't really need a server type, we just kinda need a handler, right? Because the server will be all of this stuff. Um, so for now, so type handler struct. Uh, that's gonna contain all of this logic. Handler. And the reason I'm factoring this out into its own method is I will almost certainly have a lock associated with this and such. So, um, and we're gonna have like Prometheus metrics too. Uh, HTTP handler. Uh, what am I, there we go, mux handle func. So we're gonna have Prometheus metrics for sure to do Prometheus metrics. Cool, um, we create a handler, we got the push method, we have the payload in the same package now. We're gonna have serve Unix in here as well. Uh, let's see. Do you have any tips for a foreign dev which says to start work in Germany? Ah, that could be interesting. Yeah, not, nothing I know anything about, but certainly Matthias has a lot more uh, context on that. Uh, so we can replace all of this now. So signal handler, listener, listener, and then we're going to have the handler itself. Uh, that hook handler. Yeah, that's uh, that's certainly tidier. So does that build actually? 
Build, yes it does, cool, okay. Um, Doing good, doing good. I just realized I've not been listening to music and I'm like, man, it's quiet in here. Let's uh, let's fix that really quick. Uh, Spotify. I'm gonna have to adjust the volume, I'm sure. It's like I'm wearing these headphones, but there's nothing, nothing going on. Cool. So um, we could probably factor more of this out too. We could probably factor out like a server type that accepts context and shut down and all that I think would be quite reasonable as well. So we're gonna have a server, we're gonna have a handler. Um, type server struct. So generally the way I like to factor my applications like this is if you're gonna have an HTTP server, you have the handler type and the handler ultimately is your HTTP handler logic. Uh, this is all totally separate. What's nice about this is it's really, really easy to plug into tests, right? And then my server is probably gonna do the magic of these multiple listeners, the, the fixed paths, things like that. Um, so that's probably gonna be all of this and it will be independently configurable. Again, makes things easier to test, so. Probably copy and paste a lot of this actually. Server is gonna take a context. No, the server will have a serve method, which will take a context, but. I, new server HTTP handler, will this be useful? I mean, I guess probably, right? Because that way we can test it independently as well. But so open listeners. Well, no, we're not gonna open listeners. We're actually gonna have a serve function. So server serve, that takes a context. That returns an error. Uh, interesting conversation we got going on here. Um, how does the work culture differ between the US and Germany? You've never worked in a US company over here, but you work with a lot of Americans. In Germany, we do appreciate work-life balance a lot more. People never work on the weekends, really, and after working hours. Uh, yeah, I would say that's probably pretty true. Uh, it depends on where you work, certainly, but in American culture, there's certainly an aspect of kind of wanting to always have like a, a hustle going on. And I think everybody has to kind of come to the, the point where you realize that like, you know, is this really what I want? Is this productive? Am I happy doing this? And I know for myself, like there was a little bit where all I really did was kind of work and do side projects and everything else and ended up being, oh, sorry, stretching out. Ended up being a lot, you know. Um, everybody has to find that right balance and you have to be able to find it and stand up for it on your own because your employer... Some employers, you know, are, are good. I, I'm making a generalization, but I've worked for companies before where it's like, you know, work, 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 work. I try and really squeeze people for that. And it's not healthy. So you have to be willing to like put your foot down and say no. And I learned that lesson. My younger brother just learned that lesson. Um, I, I think everybody in the United States kind of has to come to that point, unfortunately. Uh, there's less beer pong in Germany too. Yeah, that's probably true. I'm trying to fix my camera one sec. It was a little off center, it's driving me nuts. <laughs> uh, let's see here, server this has no dependencies as of yet, but it certainly will. What is this doing? All right, hang on one sec, Spotify. Spotify just did a really weird shuffle and I'm not feeling it, so I'm gonna look up. Let's see. Weezer did another new album, 2022, really? Okay, well, I guess we're uh, listening to that. <laughs> cool. It's a generalization for sure, but something you observed a bit more. Feel free to DM me on Twitter if you have more questions off stream later. Yeah, thank you for offering that, Matthias. That's very kind of you for sure. Um, yeah, I definitely. This is something we've talked about on stream a few times, like how to find like a healthy work environment, how things differ, how to like stand up for yourself. Um, certainly, if you are watching me and you're a more junior person, 
um, you're, you know, you have questions and everything. Uh, my DMs are always open as well. I'm generally quite receptive to DMs, email, etc. Unless you're blatantly trying to like sell me something, or you know, you're a a Michigan recruiter pitching me a junior sysadmin job, junior sysadmin Java developer for thirty grand a year. You know, um, I tend to ignore those, but I'm always happy to share my experiences too. So I just want to offer that. You say it also depends a lot on your age and stuff, like if you have a family life or not. Uh, yeah, certainly. That's that's incredibly true. I, I know for me, you know, I do not have children. I have a partner. Uh, but especially when I was younger, like when I was living with my college friends and working from home and everything, uh, I would just work super long hours and not care. And like I said, there comes a point where you kind of have to learn to say no. I, I imagine certainly having a family would help encourage you to say no sooner. Want to buy whiskey? Uh, yeah, I like whiskey. <laughs> I've been known to like whiskey from time to time. I want to come work as a junior in Berlin, MD Lair. Yeah, for sure. I do want to get to Berlin. Uh, I'm still trying, man. Is GopherCon Europe? Hang on. GopherCon Europe 2022. It is in Berlin. Did I miss the CFP? GCEU. Shit, are you serious? No, dude. Oh, man. Well, I uh, maybe I'll make a personal trip. I don't know. I I got tons of stuff. I, I had no idea. I, I didn't want to apply for GopherCon US this time around. They do 45-minute talks. And uh, frankly, I love GopherCon US. Let me start with saying that. 45 minutes is too long. It is... It is brutal. It takes a long time. It's exhausting. It's exhausting to write. It's exhausting to practice. Uh, I don't like doing it. I prefer half hour or 20 minutes, much more. But shit, man. Well, all right. Uh, I need to get a calendar for all these because I, yeah, I really want to go to Berlin, though. Uh, we will We will see. Jay Biddle is also disappointed. Yeah, understandably so. We'll figure it out. Oh, actually, you know what? Hang on. Uh, what were those dates? I can't go anyway. I I, I already have plans uh, that weekend. So I, I think. Um, yeah, I couldn't go anyway. Doesn't matter. All right. Well, that makes me feel better. I yeah. I already I already have plans that weekend. So um, wedding. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I was. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, next year. I, I would love to go. I, I would love to come to Berlin. Um, I may just want to make a personal trip at some point. I'm sure Jay Biddle would want to go as well. Uh, that could be a lot of fun. Cool. Uh, let's see here. So... The point where it becomes problematic is when you don't know what to do anymore and when you're not supposed to work. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, finding, making sure you have like hobbies outside of work and outside of like, I guess really, I, I I love programming first of all, but I know for me, like having hobbies like my mountain bike and other things has been really, really good for me. And I try my best to maintain a good life balance where I can, you know. You probably won't be at GopherCon EU because it's right around my, our birthday Hey, that's right. I forgot uh, Matthias and I have the same birthday, July 26th. That's hilarious. Yeah. Cool, man. Uh, we're planning vacation that week. Nice. Well, enjoy that. Uh, get Fatih too. He grew up in Germany, I believe. Yes, I believe he did, actually. Uh, I can send Fatih a message about that. But uh, knowing you want to come, you'll let me know about any conferences coming up in the future. Yeah, please do. So, uh, Matthias, I seem to remember at one point there was a conference called, like, All Systems Go, presented by, like, Kinvolk, and I would have loved to go to that. I think at the time I did not have a passport. Uh, I was relatively late to the international travel game. So, uh, if that happens again, though, I would love to go. You think Frankfurt, Maine is where he grew up, he mentioned? Yes, I believe that is true. Yep, Fatih is originally, Fatih originally did live in Germany for some time, so... What am I doing? Fix that. You've not heard about all systems going well. I gotcha. That's okay. It was just an it was just an example. 
So these are all going to be factored out. There's going to be options here like TCP, Unix, et cetera, et cetera. But for the time being, we are keeping it simple. TCP, Unix, uh, make configurable. Listen, close, start. Pass a local logger because local loggers are great because then you can shut off the logs, which is nice. This is a convention I learned at DigitalOcean, LL for local logger, and I love it. <laughs> so they do seem to be planning something for this year. Nice. Okay, let's see. All systems go. Oh, uh, am I getting some kind of like JavaScript? Uh, oh, it's an image. Uh, hello? <laughs> oh, that was weird. Coming back to 2022, Berlin. Yes, sweet. Okay. I do want to go to this. Following a two-year hiatus. Awesome. I think this would be fun. I have done so much weird system call stuff that like I think that I could have like a pretty cool talk for this and it would be something totally new for me. Sponsor prospectus. Uh, let's see here. Is there a CFP for this, Matthias? Oh, here it is. CFP coming soon. Okay, cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and that doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, cool. Um, please do, if you hear any news about this, please do let me know because I really wanna go to this conference. I think this would be really, really fun. Um, foundational user space Linux conference. Like that's what I do. I love messing with stuff with this layer, you know? And I think I can do a pretty compelling talk. So cool. Uh, let's close a bunch of tabs, get back to this. All right, um, I'll be back in just a sec, BRB. All right, we're back. Have I have I shown my have I shown my setup on stream yet? It's pretty cool. Twitter.com MD Lair. I suspect if you're here, you've probably already seen my Twitter, but Oh no, this is old. It's not the one. There we go. Yes, this is my current this is my current setup. Uh really happy with it. It's super clean. Got my LTTstore.com, LTTstore.com. Uh new desk pad, everything else. You know, it's it's awesome. Big fan so far. So yeah, I uh, definitely would recommend monitor arms. They make a huge difference if you've got multiple displays like me. My cabling is so much cleaner. I have a ridiculous amount of space now to work with over here. I can keep stuff in my desk or keep it tidy. Um, my vertical monitor now is no longer too high. Hashtag not in head, <laughs> yeah. I remember Dominic and I had a conversation about the vertical monitor. He was like, how do you not hurt your neck You know, with the old setup? And I was like, oh, it seems fine. But honestly, it did hurt my neck like with the... Uh, over time, especially like having it on top of my stereo receiver and all the way up was difficult. So now with the new setup, uh, back, see, it comes down in front and I can actually like swivel it out of the way to get to the stereo if I need to. Um, so, you know, once or twice a day, I move the monitor, tweak things, put it back, but uh, it makes a huge difference. Monitor arms, totally worth it from an ergonomics perspective. <laughs> yeah, Dominic laughs. Turns out you were right. See, now it's the same height as mine. Yeah, you, you raise a good point. 
Uh, looks clean. Good luck keeping it that way. Yeah, for sure. I'm generally pretty good about that. Um, the one thing, the one thing with my desk is that I do have a tendency to let it get a little dusty because of all of the cabling. I think it'll be easier to keep clean now though because I've got everything better tidied away. Uh, what's up, Emran Kambadi? Uh, totally irrelevant. But did you use Nix OS with Netboot? You want to try Netboot stuff for the home lab? I do have Netboot.xyz configured on my on my uh, router, it will actually do TFTP boot and everything, but I do not have Nix OS configured with it. Like I know there are some folks who do like crazy things like wiping their root file system every reboot. I don't do that. No, I, uh, I, I'm not brave enough. <laughs> Great setup by the way. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. I'm, I'm super happy with the way it came together. Let's see. Uh, these logs get replaced. All of the logs get replaced actually with a local logger. Not this one. Forgot a dot. Uh, let's see here, S surf. So this is gonna block until you close it and then it's gonna issue a shutdown. And then we close. So the handler right now is going to take a logger as a dependency as well. So the reason I like doing this, I am very much against like global use of logs and whatever else. The reason I like doing these local loggers is in your tests, you know, you can keep these logs because they are useful, but in your tests, you pass a no op logger and then you don't get log output in your tests. So ends up being nice. It requires more discipline, but I really do think that no globals is the way to go. If you are capable of having the discipline to do so, Cool. Uh, I think that's all fixed up now. So we create a server, we pass a handler. So let's see here, Z hook new server. Log to standard error, uh, prefix none. We'll do the standard flags for now. And then we replace all these log instances too with the local logger, right? Um, started listening, help, uh, serve context. So canceled, server canceled, started server. Server signaled. Okay. Uh, this all goes away as well. And now the only thing we have in main is this, right? So we have managed to reduce things down to this level already, which is pretty cool. Failed to serve Z hook D. Cool. Log is a dependency too, so I also think it should be visible. Yeah, I totally agree. It, it just makes things so much cleaner when easier to understand, like when you can pass everything like this. Gotta run, take care everyone. Hey, thanks for hanging out, man. Uh, take it easy and I uh, hope to see you later this year. So take care. So I guess the question is like, is it actually that useful for me to take a separate handler? I mean, I had just discussed how probably, but I don't know. Maybe. It's gonna to need to take a Prometheus registry and such for sure, but I suppose for the time being, we can stick with this, you know, and just try and see what works, so. The server is the Z hook D server entry point. Which, uh, let's 
sensors traffic using the input handler. Do I want to make that a concrete? No, probably not, I guess. It's going to return an HTTP handler interface. So, so actually, I guess this can be unexported, can it? Dot handler for Z hook D logic. Good old compile time type assertions. Missing serve. Oh, no, just it would be the push function. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's already verified anyway. Or the mux is actually doing it for us. So, new handler constructs. HTTP.handler for use with the server push implements the HTTP post push logic for the cool. Um, this is repetitive. I do want to clean that up too. This can now be it's in the same package. So content JSON. Let's see here. Decode the payload, remote address, connection. Hmm. So this is potentially where I might like factor out like an error handler or something, but we're gonna leave it alone for now. So to do MD layer, consider factoring out middleware for request validation. So this is interesting. So the way that the remote addresses appear, if somebody's connecting over Unix socket, you get this sigil, like this hint, and then we call the Unix path. Otherwise we just serve HTTP. Um, so I can't think of any better way to differentiate. Like this seems perhaps a little fragile to me, but I don't know how else to actually verify that it's a Unix socket underneath. I suppose we could look at the Godox, right? So. <laughs> uh, not HTTP. So we want a uh, request method. Are you checking URL? Um, let's parse from the URI. For most requests, the fields other than path and raw query will be empty. Yeah, so we can't differentiate from the URL. Protocol version, header. Body. Hmm. Content transfer. Yeah, I don't host. Host on which the URL is sought. Okay, let's check that really quick. Oh, hang on just one sec. I need to, I need to sneeze, I think. <laughs> I'll try and I'll try and mute it if I can catch it in time. <laughs> but uh let's try let's try the host. I'm curious about that. Um what kind of data does that give us? Right? So I'll just do this first of all. <laughs> Bless you, thanks. <laughs> I managed to stifle it for now, but I suppose we will see how long that lasts, you know? So now that this is fixed, we should no longer need to remove the socket beforehand, except for this one last time, I think. Cool. Good deal. Uh, okay. So that sent SSH connection. Oh, interesting. So there's like variables for SSH too. Huh. Dbus. Okay. So this is everything in the request. There's all kinds of, oh gosh. Uh, maybe I didn't want to spew this actually. Host. Uh, what the heck is that? Is 
that base64? Remote address request URI. That looks like nonsense to me. So let's try building it one more time and find out. Yeah, I don't understand what that is. Okay. Um, is it the base64 of the socket address path? Yeah, you know, it, I guess it might be, but doesn't base64 always have an equal sign afterward? Base64 was my first thought as well, or like URL encoding. So... Which encoding URL encoding URLs and file names? Hmm. That seems like it might be. Okay, decode. Let's take a look at this. Equals is padding, you can have base64 without trailing equals. Okay, yeah, that's what I wasn't sure about. So if this gives us what we want, then that's kind of nice, but I'm not sure if it does or not. Probably get rid of all this junk. I don't think it, hey, sweet, okay. Uh, well, that's great because that tells us if we connected over Unix or not. Cool, that's even better. Okay. Um, Well, that's dope. So we wanna make sure it works over TCP as well, actually. So localhost 19 push. Oh, right. Ugh. Right. There we go. Illegal base64 data. Uh, so hang on. So if it's Unix socket, it's doing base64. Is that because of the slashes? Is that why? Is this just a, is this just like a standard URL encoding? Like, can I, uh, sorry, hang on. URL encode. Should be in the HTTP plus Unix package, I think. Uh, don't think so, unfortunately. So path on escape, query escape, query on escape. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so, but isn't this also the base64 stuff? I don't know for sure. So we're getting an escape of some sort from the client because it's sending a host with slashes in it. So let's uh let's try the URL package too. I'm curious. Um, I'm gonna get rid of this stuff for now. I don't actually care at the moment. So. Path on escape. Okay, um, just out of curiosity here. Okay. Yeah, the so the Unix transport package is pretty Spartan at this point. Um, Peter Borgen, Unix transport. I actually did send a PR, but I think you should not depend on host because host can be overridden by the host header. That's a good point. You're right, it can, can it? Well, shoot. Yeah, I just want to know if we're connecting over Unix socket or not. So that that's a good point though. A real question, uh, how do you do errors in Go? Which package do I use and how do I log? So my personal preference is the standard library errors package. 
Um, again, so that would be the, let's see, server. Errors is, errors as, yeah, this. My personal preference these days is the standard library package. At work, we are using the package errors. Um, package errors being the basically very similar, but it does stack traces as well. I personally don't think package errors is that useful at this point, but it's already in a convention. I have worked at places that have used both loggers and zap. I think structured logging is good. I think that if you're gonna do structured logging though, you need to go all in and you need to make sure that like, if you have uh, a field with data that you're not doing any like formatted print strings in there, you wanna do plain text strings to actually use the log key values. Um, so I guess really the answer is it depends, but for companies, I think structured logging with strict rules is a good thing. And I think that packet or the standard library errors package is good enough would be my personal opinion. Like Fastlayer, et cetera. Uh, I'm at planet scale now, by the way. I'm not sure. That's a couple couple months ago, but I, I left Fastly in December. So I have no idea what Fastly is doing anymore. But uh, we got a link here for, oh uh, yeah, not a problem. Happy to help. Ah, uh, I see. Raw URL encoding. Line 93. I see. So I guess this is good and I want this, but the problem is, is that we can't rely on it because the, um, like Emrick and Body says, we can't rely on this right because the host could override it with any path they want or the, the client can overwrite with any path they want. Isn't that correct? So. So, server. Let's try it with uh, the Z Hut client one more time. Uh, yeah, so interesting. I do want the path that socket is the problem. I guess the remote address would be useful too though. True, but do I care? I mean, I, I need to know if I wanna trigger this path or not really is the issue, but I guess I don't actually care about the exact address of the socket at this point. So I suppose this is good enough for now. I mean, Otherwise, I have to unconditionally hijack and unconditionally type assert the connection, which is doable, but. Well, I mean, I suppose I could do that anyway, right? So, for example. If we do this. If we were to always hijack the connection, then we actually get a hold of that as well. So, and they can't fake that, right? Because that's the local address of our socket that we are bound to. So I suppose if we're okay with unconditionally hijacking the connection, then it's fine. I mean, yeah. Keeps things slightly simpler that way, I suppose. If we want to do one path or one one like logical path, but yeah, I'm just trying to think of like how to harden this thing because I feel like for my personal use case, I'm probably just gonna enable the Unix socket and then not enable sending over HTTP. Like HTTP would be metrics, but trying to understand why I would behave differently over IP than Unix. Uh, Cause for Unix, I want to be able to get this peer cred. Like I, I like to be able to get peer cred here because I can actually verify, for example, that like root is sending us data and not like somebody else because the Zlet is going to be invoked as root. And then we can also check the process ID if we wanted to. So it's like, it gives us more ability to like verify the payload. Like this is all hypothetical of course, but I, I just feel like there could be something interesting to do with this, you know?
I could be wrong. This could be a waste of time, you know, but... <laughs> and actually, uh, if we're going to lean into Linux, then... Uh, let's see here. PidFD. If this is really Linux only, we could open a PidFD and do interesting things with that, you know? So it's like... I don't know. I'm just having fun. So I can hijack and then test if it's Unix con. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. Um, that's exactly what I'm doing. The thing is, is that uh, I could I could just choose to do it all the time and then I could try and get the credentials. I could type a cert right here, but then we lose this fallback path. So step one, screw BSD, step two, have fun. Yeah, I think we're just gonna have fun. I, I think that having fun sounds like fun, right? <laughs> So you know what? I'm just gonna, we're gonna have everything go through this path because why not? So let's see here. Yeah, have fun, cross that bridge when I get there. Yeah, this is a, this is a totally goofy side project. I'm just like, I just wanna have a good time with it. So we're gonna, we're gonna do that, you know? Uh, do we need the net con? I don't think so. So for now, this can all be part of the same handler, I suppose, but I guess what this would actually be is pure creds. So we would get a response back. No, we don't get a response back. We would just get the pure creds. And then a Boolean as to whether or not we could get them. So Let's see here. So we need potentially a signature like this if we wanted to like actually do this properly. But we would only need to pass W to this. Simplify a bit more. Uh, let's see here. So nil, false. I feel like, yeah, this is such a specialized thing that like, I just kind of want to play around and have fun. So failed to hijack connection. We don't want to close the connection or flush here now. So we actually do need to return. Oh, shoot. Hmm, interesting. So if we do manage to hijack this successfully, then we have to return the everything we get back from it. Oh, <laughs> that's a bit of a struggle. Um, how do we, because we have the underlying connection, we have the buffered writer to it. Maybe this should be like a terminal point. I don't know. So maybe, do this first. So we have W, we have R. We can no longer use W. We can no longer, we can use R, but we can't write anything, so that's fine. So W gets consumed effectively. We still have R. It's effectively read only beyond this point. We could have the creds. We could have whether or not we found the creds. We could have any errors that occur getting all that data. So hypothetically, Posts got to um. Hmm. 
don't even bother to read the body possibly. But then, hang on, if we, wait, if we if we call hijack, I don't think we can do anything. I don't think we can read the body anymore, can we? So I think we do have to have it back down here. Ugh. This is a struggle, gang. Sorry. I'm, uh, I'm definitely overcomplicating. So for the record, I'm definitely overcomplicating this. I'm, the thing is though, is I, I want to play around. Like the fact that this listens on Unix socket at all is just interesting. It's like unusual. And I, I guess for this project, like I just feel like I want to, again, have fun, mess around, you know? So, uh, And then probably something like this. Maybe return the writer. I can't try to do an SO peer cred on the FD and if it fails, assert to an IP con. Uh, well, that's exactly what this does effectively. Like that's what it's doing right now. Um, the thing is, is that uh, yeah, so I, I need to hijack the connection in order to get to the file descriptor, in order to call syscallcon, in order to eventually call so peer cred. So we have to hijack the connection if we want any way of getting at this. Unless we use reflection, I think, uh, which is, you know, uh, <laughs> not really, <laughs> not really a good idea, probably. <laughs> probably not a good idea, <laughs> you know, like... Um, does HTTP test support hijack? Uh, yeah, I, I, it shouldn't matter. It's just, uh, hijack just tells the HTTP server library not to do anything else is all it does. So we could potentially use reflection to get at the file descriptor that lives inside this thing. Um, I'm not saying that's a great idea, but we could. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna go down that road quite yet. Uh, let's see here. Unsupported system error not implemented. So So like I know this works. I'm just trying to make it not super disgusting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> I'll explain that in a sec. If, let's see here. So what we're doing here is if we get a TCP connection, we're gonna hand the raw IO writer back and then clean up, finalize the response to write out the final response and ultimately clean up this connection. Nil, format error F, failed to get peer credentials. What time is it? 11.38. Okay, we're doing good. Probably gonna do probably another hour of streaming, I imagine. Um, this does work. We're just at this point where we're kind of a bit off in the weeds having fun. So yeah, I'm, I'm having fun. At least hope you all are too. <laughs> so. To do MD layer, do something with peer creds. Uh, 
print f return uh, bw cleanup nil. Okay, so we are trying to call this done. I prefer that name actually. Let's see here. Uh, we've taken control of the. Let's see here. We control the rest of the life cycle of the netcon. So now we must either clean up at every error return or and the cleanup function back to the caller on success. You're writing uh, the type assertion. Yeah, so this um this function's already doing that for me. The reason I'm not writing that is because peer cred will already do that for me. I, I was taking a look yesterday and this error not implemented as well get and result and return. So uh, we're just keeping things slightly simpler because this already takes a net con anyway. So, uh, but yes, that, that is effectively what I, what I am doing here as well. Cool. Um, failed to get peer credentials. Oh, so we can no longer, so as soon as hijack happens, we can no longer write anything, can we? Huh, interesting. So, if we fail to get peer creds, then we can't return an, H an error here. So, interesting. Not implemented. Oh, unsupported con type actually is what it is. Hmm, that's tricky. Well, it's a, uh, yeah. What happens if we already hijacked but got an error getting the peer cards? We can't use the below anymore. Uh, let's see here. Oh, <laughs> silly. Um, yeah, so we'd have to write an error back to the client manually. So... To do MD layer, figure out how to report errors to the client. At this point, we can no longer use W. Can no longer use W. Use BW instead to write data back to the client. And that will flush everything as well. Okay, so that, that works. To do MD layer, um, bubble up an error here. Um, maybe not quite. Do something done. Okay, so I think this works. Ready? Run it. Um, we'll do a curl first. Uh, work just fine. I mean, it's not printing anything, but it works. And then this also works. 
Cool. So what we'll do for now is we'll print out just the, the, the bare basics probably pretty much. So remote address P Keep it simple, right? Local logger, print F, uh, make copies of both, I suppose. Okay, so if we curl this, that works. And if we Unix socket it, that also works. Good deal, okay. So that does exactly what we want, which is great. Cool. I think it's probably time to, uh, I guess, commit this or get close. So, uh, serve serves. Um, the Z hook D receiver and blocks until the context is canceled. Oh yeah, I was gonna factor out these addresses as well, I think. So. Hmm. I guess it's fine for now. I'll do it later. Failed listen TCP, Unix, started server. We got both listeners going. We have the multi-listener as well. Um, listeners, actually this, I, this type I think has a special method for that. So if we build this again, we share it. Yep, there we go. Oh, the string does not add a Make addresses, addresses. Ah, yeah, I intended for that to have a, a space, I'm sure, but that's okay, we can fix it later. Not a big deal. Um, okay, so let's see here. To do make configurable. Start the, let's see here. Uh, combine the listeners and serve on both at once. Serve connections on both at once. When the input context is canceled, uh, I guess this already has a good comment below. So we detach from the parent. The parent is already canceled. We received a signal. This context is detached from parent because the parent is already canceled, but we want to give a short period of time for outstanding requests to complete and drain. Yep, makes sense to me. Also cleans up the Unix socket listener socket file good deal okay uh prometheus metrics not right now factor up middleware you've got to get some sleep take care hey thanks for hanging out i appreciate it uh yeah see you around middleware hijacked connection client variables we synthesize a response using status code proto major minor Server, I guess it doesn't really matter that the server is, it's just useful for like curl purposes and stuff so you know what it is, right? Oh, let's see here. There we go. Uh, hey, how's it going, Christopher? 
Yep, 204, no content. Server was at hook D, easy enough. Good deal, good deal. Connection to host left intact. No, we want to close that actually, don't we? Because the thing is that this is going to send like, the, the use case this is optimized for is closing, is sending single connections from the binary. It literally sends one connection and then goes away. So we're going to try and close that out. I'm um, doing fine. How about you? Nice app, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I'm doing really well. Just uh, hanging out and working on working on stuff, having a good time doing projects, you know? You saw it on Twitter? Yeah, nice. Yeah, I, I'm really proud of the way it came together. Definitely worth the money to get everything set up all nice and tidy. Uh, there's something about close in here. HTTP response, is that new? You miss that it exists? Uh, normally you see it on the client side, but yeah, you can do it from the server side as well. So this is the first time I've done this, but it does seem to work. So I guess the expedient way would be right? Like don't, don't bother me. Please take your connection away. Yeah, there we go. Cool. Good deal. Optimize for one off connections from Yep. Uh let's see here. So hijack uh takes over the connection and exposes. Uh why do you want to close the connection if the client keeps open? Because this is going to be because the binary that's talking to this sends literally one HTTP request and then goes away. So I want to terminate things basically as fast as possible. So in fact, if there are other parameters I can tweak to make it so that connections just go away, I should be doing that. So it's actually something we can look at right here. Handler, TLS, read timeout. Uh, we'll make these things quick. We're going to be pretty aggressive on these. Oops. And we can make these configurable if we need to, but we're going to keep it simple for now. Error log is good. Uh, the context. Uh. A function that returns the base context for incoming requests on this server. The provide listener is the specific listener that's about to start accepting requests. Interesting. So that would probably be worth configuring then because we have the listener. So. Modifies the context used for a new connection. This is interesting. We could we could do something really dirty, like store the context. Yep, I can see it working. Five seconds is ages on a Unix socket. Yes, that's true. But it's also like it's aggressive enough where it's it's lax enough where if you know, but yeah, you're you're right. I could probably get away with like two seconds, but we're just gonna go with five for now. This kind of context is interesting because we could potentially like, instead of hijacking the connection, we could abuse the fact that we have a hook to it here, store it in a context key, and then ultimately get it to peer creds that way, <laughs> which I mean would work, I think. So instead of hijacking might be reasonable because all we want is a way to get at the file descriptor. So I might try that actually. So really quick before we do anything wild, uh, let's checkpoint again. Yeah, that's uh, that's gonna be crazy. So con state now. 
con context. A function that modifies the context used for a new connection as a server context key value. Oops. It accesses the server that started the handler. Oh, so is this intended to be if you have multiple HTTP servers on different listeners? I have multiple listeners on one server, so I'm doing this the inverse way. Maybe I'll change that, but it's not a big deal. Access the local address the connection arrived on. Okay, um, let's try let's try that dirty trick I was just talking about because I'm curious now. So, con context, a function that modifies the context used for a connection. So. This is a uh, this is a thing. Uh, context key. So key con context key equals iota. With uh, ctx equals context dot with value ctx key context key value. <laughs> <laughs> this is really bad. <laughs> this is really bad, but this means we don't have to hijack, I think, which is might be better. So, um, <laughs> um, just, are you ready for this? Hang on. So, we... Our context. So now we can do context dot value of key con gives us an any. Yeah. <laughs> have to go. Always fun watching me. Hey, thanks so much for hanging out. Uh, take care. Hope you have a nice day. This is a. Uh, Truly my most incredible work ever. So we know for a fact that that is a net con. <laughs> so for, for, for now, we'll do, we'll print the peer creds. We need to be careful though, because we don't own this connection. So it has to be like a read only access effectively. Failed to get peer credentials. Let's see here. Oh no, we're not returning an error right now. We're just gonna return the, we're just gonna return the creds. Status, no content, and then we can add the headers we want as well. So, header set. Oh, I think this works. I fully recognize this is an abuse and certainly you could do really bad things with this, but if as long as we do read only accesses, I think we're fine. I think it works fine. So. Let's see here. I just wanna see if this works really quick. I don't see any reason why I won. Let's put it that way.
Yep, it totally works. <laughs> <laughs> oh i love it okay yeah we're we're, we're keeping that <laughs> that beats that beats all of this all of this logic so it's it's a hack but we have to enforce discipline so uh danger yolo this we have to treat all accesses we can only perform read only accesses of the netcon here and cannot book methods like read write close etc because that the http that http server ultimately owns this netcon we just want to get access to the underlying local address and file descriptor for SO peer cred. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> That's going on Twitter. <laughs> We must perform only read. We must only perform We must treat the netcon here as read only and cannot invoke methods. There we go. Okay. That's great. Does HTTP do reuse of the connections to save allocations? Could the con ever end up being reused? Uh Good question. I doubt it. I don't think. I I don't think that the same. I ultimately would have a different file descriptor, and every file descriptor gets its own new con in the runtime network polar. So I think this is fine actually, but that is a that is a valid concern. Um, to do MD layer, is it possible for? See, the, what I would worry about is I would worry about reusing the file descriptor, right? But I'm not reusing the file descriptor. I'm reusing the netcon. And I don't think that's a problem, actually. So, and the only place we're not holding on to this, we're simply getting it while it's active, while the context is here. So, so we have the context. So we could potentially cancel other outstanding operations here. Yeah, I think we're okay. I, I think we're okay. Do you really need the con or could you just copy the cred? Uh, I mean, yeah, I just want the cred, but it's like I want the addresses too probably. But yeah, you're right. I could just get rid of, like I could stop using the con. Um, I could just get a hold of the, the data I want, which is the peer creds, the local and remote addresses. So um, ultimately should work fine, I do believe, but... We're gonna we're gonna stick with it for now because it's silly first of all, but it seems seems okay. I mean, hard to tell, but it seems okay. Uh, yeah, I think we're probably gonna we'll probably clean this up just a little bit more and then end up pushing it, and then we can uh, yeah, we'll, we'll figure out what's going on. So, con context, you know, maybe honestly, maybe this is an excuse to file an issue upstream because there's already this context key mechanism, local address, the local address the connection arrived on. So that is something I did want as well. So maybe there could be one for like setting socket options or something, you know? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I got that right for vet, right? Doesn't vet complain? Doesn't vet complain if you use a type that can be anything else? I think we're good. What's the, I wonder what the context key type is in the standard library. I, I thought it was just, you could use like an integer, but type, hang on. Oh, it's got a name. It fits in an interface without allocation. Interesting. 
Hmm. Yeah. I think what I'm doing is also fine. It's opaque. Let's look at the docs really quick. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. I, I figured it would work, but seeing it actually do it is hilarious. So that cracks me up. Not for passing optional parameters. Must be comparable, should not be of type string or any other built-in type. So type fav context key string. Any other built-in type. But as long as you make a, a new type, it's fine. Users of with value should also define their own types for keys. Often have a concrete type. To avoid allocating when assigned to an interface, often have a concrete type of struct. Okay. Uh, so we'll do what the standard library does, I suppose. That kind of opaque uh, structure used as a context key is a key for context context uh, values key netcon stores a netcon in a context. Pretty funny. Okay. So now we have like our opaque struct type here. It's a pointer. It should be fine. We're doing the exact same thing in the standard library does. So cool. Yep, that works. Yeah, that's that's hilarious. Oh, actually we don't even need the we already have the remote address from HTTP and we can get the local address as well. So I suppose what we could do here if we wanted to be good citizens is do the following, right? So we have the context, then we have the address is going to be Yeah, maybe maybe keeping it scoped as small as possible is the correct way. Key local adder context key. The string, sorry, oh, uh, did not mean to do that. Ah, I moved all my windows, didn't I? Sorry. So for HTTP, hang on. Um, local adder context key. It'll be a type net adder, okay, cool, so. That is better. Any use of the netcon from context, press context as read only. I cannot invoke methods like read write close, et cetera, because the net HTTP server ultimately owns this netcon. We just wanted to get access to the underlying local address and file descriptor for SO pure cred. Yep. I think this is fine. It's hilarious, but yeah, I think it's fine.
So yeah, maybe maybe this merits filing a standard library uh, request or something. Because it's just, yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting use case. I feel like it is valid. Yep. And then uh, we'll, we'll curl it again too. Curl also works. Cool, good deal. Good deal, gang. So if error is not equal to nil, Uh, errors is error. So we're doing a bit of error handling here. So, let's see here. Failed to get peer, creden peer creds, credentials, internal server error, internal. This is pretty damn funny. This is going on Twitter for sure. So now we should get it for both types. <laughs> Sweet. That's that's hilarious. I love it. Cool. Well, you know what? Um I'm getting kind of hungry. It's about a little afternoon here. I think we might actually wrap pretty quick here. Um, I'm probably gonna checkpoint this again one more time because I'm gonna be going out of town here in a couple of hours. So I think we're gonna checkpoint this work and maybe I'll end up filing a go issue as well, but let's, uh, let's wind down. So consider filing an issue for the standards library to figure out how to get read-only access to a netcon, maybe just its file descriptor. I mean, clearly this could be like a foot gun API if you're not careful, but I think it works, you know. Con context. And actually, I think I was also going to, let's see here. Serve base context. Specifies the function that returns the base context or incoming request is the specific listener it's about to start accepting. So base context is nil. So we want to associate the request context, I think, with the server as well, possibly. Oh, well, maybe not. I don't know. I think this is, actually, I think this is fine. So, uh, we have to set base context here, won't we? Ah, uh, I see. Hmm, okay. This doesn't mean this type is not concurrency safe, but I guess that's fine anyway. There's no guarantee of it being concurrency safe. Associate the Listeners are ready. Associate the base context of use serves context as a base. So yeah, I think the, the point here is like, you know, again, this could be potentially served by different listeners or something, but um, we're using this multi-net thing I wrote. So we're messing around, having fun. Amend my work in progress one more time. Um, let's see here. So 
So static analysis. Cool. I love it. It's pretty funny. Uh, oops. There's no test coverage for the server type yet, but we did get a chance to move out, which is good. Um, let's see here. Yeah. Initial handler and server types. Cool. Um, so for those who have been following along, if you haven't seen the repo yet, we do have a GitHub repo here. Um, things have been, things looking pretty good at this point. I definitely want to write some more tests and such, but you know, the, the server ends up looking like this. Basically you take a context from a signal. We set up a logger in the server we call serve. That's it. And then the client, uh, sets up a client, which is going to connect to the environment variables, also does signal handling and then ultimately pushes the state to the server. And that's that. So uh, yeah, this is pretty cool. Um, so I think we're gonna wrap stream here. Uh, assuming my GitHub actions pass, which I don't see why they wouldn't. Oh, hey, actually. Ah, license, yeah. For my Apache 2 projects, I do try to do the typical thing of keeping a license header at the top of the files. Um, so that'll fix that. Yes, I'm amending and force pushing on main, making deal, but uh, cool. Well, thank you all so much for hanging out. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, let's see, you know, I have no idea, but I want to see if there are any other like programming streamers streaming so I can send somebody a raid. I think that would be kind of nice, you know, so I'm going to open up Twitch really quick and I'm going to take a look and see what's going on. Um, oh, RWX Rob is working on something. Um, let's see. What's he working on? Uh, so I don't know if that's Rob is streaming or we got some Zig going on. Zig could be kind of cool um, by Christoph IT. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you know what, let's go with uh, Let's go with Zig stream here. That sounds like kind of fun. So uh, cool. Uh, we are going to send a raid over Zig auto docs by Christoph IT. Uh, should be a good time. So let's get that going really quick. One sec. Where is the raid button? Cool. Well, thank you all so much for hanging out. I, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, thank you for spending time with me today. It's been a lot of fun and I hope to see you next time. So thanks so much and see you around. Bye now.